Hi, I'm Jen Henning from Flip Normals, and welcome back to another podcast episode. This time we're going to be tackling whole debacle about VFX, CGI in films, and the apparent bad rap that it has with a lot of people, studios, everyone except for the people that actually work on the films, especially the VFX artists. So we have a lot of points we want to cover, so come along for this talk. And also remember right now, we have a Black Friday sale going. 50% off all Flip Normals exclusives and over 30,000 products are actually on sale on flipnormals.com. This is this is such an, an interesting topic when it comes to basically anyone who's working in VFX or anything creative there. Because I think we kind of know in our hearts that when a movie is saying that there is no VFX in this or everything is shot practically, that is not true. Like that is actually just bullshit. Like there, there is no way yeah. that massive movies are just not using any kind of cg or like you know not even like just wire removals and stuff like that but like fully generated assets one of the reasons we're doing this is because it, honestly it hurts a little <laughs> it hurts when you've been spending a lot of time on on a, a show and you feel that you've just been diminished entirely where the stuff you know is your work in a movie people are being like yeah it's just we just did it in a practical manner that is disrespectful and, and it's also just not true. Like it's just, it's just about setting the record straight as well. At least if you're working on a film where it's a giant alien, giant robot, there's dog fights in space. It's a lot easier to go, well, obviously there's CT. No one's going to refute that. And I feel like when it's that obvious, you also don't hear about films being bad because of CG, because people just tend to accept them for, for what they are. I think what irks us the most is, like Henning is saying, you know, you're working on a shot or you're working on a film where maybe you work directly on it. And the studios come out and they, they proclaim that almost no CG was used in, in the making of this film. And you know for a fact that that, that isn't true. I think one of the important points here is also that at least from my perspective it seems like a lot of it's like it, it's like an like almost like a an old mentality of, of like well cg in films equals a, a bad film whereas that's not true it's like bad cg in films is just bad cg it doesn't make the film bad the film is bad because it was poorly written poorly directed bad management, that's what, that's what makes a bad film. All of that, if you add CG on top of that, of course the CG is also going to be bad because it suffers under the same issues that the film would have had had there been CG or not. I think that's one of the important points here. I worked, I worked on a movie some years ago now called A Monster Calls. It was a really fun movie to work on. We made a the team at NBC that I was a part of, we we created a giant tree monster. That was the monster, the title, the title, title monster here. So it's a giant tree monster, basically like a big version of Groot. Not a lot of people actually saw the movie. It's actually a really lovely film. And they built the, the head of the monster on set and parts of the body. And um, that's, of course, what they're marketing. They're marketing us as being a practical creation. What they didn't market is that we created the whole recreate a whole head in CG. Quite a, quite a true representation of what it was done on set. Like we really used that as a basis for, for what was there. But we did rebuild the whole thing. And, and not just if we rebuild it, we had to redesign parts of it as well because obviously a, a two meter tall, meter and a half tall head built in some kind of fake wood is you can't articulate that. Like if you have an actor coming in, in this game as well as Liam Neeson who was coming in to do the voice work for that, they have to use his performance for that. And you just need to recreate the whole thing and not just not just the head the there wasn't a version of the body on set like the body would have been the size of a, of a large building and that was just done entirely in cg for there there was absolutely nothing from from the real from real life there and in basically every single shot apart from i think one or two shots the cg version is what's being used for for absolutely the whole thing now <laughs> still a little salty about that but this is not really about just that experience this is about what happens in the whole industry this happens all the time that they take the work and stuff you know and your heart is real or in your in your brain rather because you you worked on it you just know that it there's just no way that they're telling the truth so they're 
they're straight up lying in in marketing. There are so many movies now that are coming out that they're they're talk, keep talking about how it's all all CG. One of them is like Top Gun Maverick, that they they kept oh, yeah. on talking about this being a practical movie, and it has like two thousand four hundred VFX shot or something like that. It's it's a fantastic <laughs> achievement when it comes to VFX, and it's not just. I think it was nominated for the Oscar as well last year, and I think it, it lost to Avatar. Can't remember exactly that, but it, it's not like there are just some like paint removals on some 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 planes here and there. Like entire sequences are basically done entirely in in CG, like fully fully digital planes. There are planes that aren't like they can't fly because they're too old, or the the planes are entirely like generated because they're they're not they don't exist in the real world like the the whole anta- the antagonist of the movie the fifth generation fighter or whoever they're supposed to be or what they're supposed to be they don't exist in the real world and it's probably one of the reasons they're cg because they're they don't want to antagonize anyone they're suspiciously yeah. silent as to who that antagonist is <laughs> and also for for shots like that where i think people need to understand something obviously we're talking to largely a vfx and, and games interested crowd so a lot of you will be aware but for the people that aren't aware oftentimes what you use the real stuff for is getting lighting reference for the cg shots so if you have something like a plane for for top gun it's massively beneficial to have the real planes for your texture your shading and your lighting reference so you know how to actually create it and what scenario it needs to be lit in another one is a lot of it is also done for the plate. So if you have something like uh, Tom Cruise in a plane, you would shoot the actor's performance, you know, that's the plate, and you would then comp that on top of the CG scene. So you would have maybe like straight on or, and from the side, and maybe like a cockpit view. That's, that's the plate, the real plate that then gets composited over or on top of the CG shot because... Obviously, you're not going to have a lot of these shots where you see outside of the plane, planes are doing crazy maneuvers, blowing up in real time. You can't have that in shot in camera. You have to create that in CG. And this is just a smart way of doing it. Like, we don't really have a position, like, which one is best to use practical VFX. Like, for me, like, it's the same thing whenever we talk about any kind of software, right? Are you on Blender team or Team Blender or Seabirds or Maya or whatever? It doesn't matter. We, we just... I just like cool stuff. So if a movie is made entirely in CG or entirely in, in with practical stuff, like for me, that's not really a huge concern. It's it's just do whatever works. Uh, my only point is that they should be honest about that because otherwise you're diminishing a whole, not even like a whole department, but like it's not like VFX is is just like catering, like giving somebody food on set or something. It's It's like the literal end product for... A massive amount of of the, the final pixels in the shot. They're entirely generated by that. If you were to take away all the um, all the CG shots from a movie, you don't actually have a movie. So the the filmmaker should be able to use whatever tools they want to. You know, all practical CG. Go for it. Just just be upfront about that, or you know, don't. It's fine. Just don't be dishonest <laughs> about that whole thing. Yeah, and cool if you want to be make it a selling point that it's practical go for that but you know and not to diminish the work of uh, caterers no. but imagine <laughs> no. if, if they did that did that for a film they're like no caterers worked on this film everyone brought their own lunch like yeah okay but we know they didn't why why would you say that like it's it's such a silly thing where it's it's almost like our conversations about uh, you know the question we get is like oh is blender industry standard yet and which tool should i use blender's really great for this like it doesn't matter whatever gets the job done that's what you should use and if your shot requires practical effects, 100%, then use practical. If it requires a combination or full CG, then that's what we should go for. Um, I think it's a... I'm just baffled more than anything by this weird rhetoric, I guess, of, of CG. CG equals bad film, when that's clearly not the case. You know, take a film like Gravity. It, amazing film. And shot in space and Sandra Bullock I, I think it's gravity it's called gravity right yeah that went th- 2013 well, yeah. one yeah yeah Sandra Bullock yeah exactly and that's that's like 99% CG like you actually don't realize how much is CG until you see a VFX breakdown 
where it's like with Sandra Bullock and being in the suit and everything is like it's literally just like the visor is the only part of the plate that's kept from from the real shots everything else is CG and it's done to an incredible degree you know it's so well done and and obviously it's an amazing film as well and and the amazing film carries that forward so i think that people have less complaints with cg because they don't think about it they don't think about the integration they don't think about it being like cg was actually a crucial storytelling element for gravity and because everything works together people tend to they like they tend to forget which i think that's how i think cg should be used right you shouldn't think about the cg if you think about the cg and you notice it then it's bad CG, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it was a bad film. They, um, they finished Gravity, like, I think a few months, six months, eight months or something, like before I started at Framestore as an intern. I, mean, I was an intern in Framestore in 2014, and they, they, there was so much stuff from Gravity. People kept talking about Gravity all the time, and, and like, you're 100% spot on. Like, I mean, I could always consider Gravity to be an animated movie. Like, there is... I think there is more CG CG <laughs> yeah. shots in Gravity than in Lego Movie that came out at the same time. Because in Lego Movie, you actually have a few real live action shots as well, like actually live yeah. action. <laughs> so I consider the I consider Gravity to be essentially an animated movie at that point. It's an interesting one with um, with CG as well because sometimes I think there is an almost almost some antagonism towards using CG of effects in movie because. Honestly, sometimes out of context, it looks a little bit silly. Recently, they came up some mm-hmm. have some breakdowns from the Barbie movie that um, it was one of the studios that worked on it. I'm sure there is a lot more VFX than what was just shown there. This was this was almost like that quote unquote silly CG because they're they're jumping into a car and the car is all CG. And why on earth is that car CG? It's not doing anything special in, in that regard. It's just a car and they're kind of just going in to the car but there could be a few reasons for this it's most likely not the cg artist was going like you know what you should just do everything in cg it could be the case that it's it's a brand deal with the car company i can't remember who which car it is but maybe it's the next models well next year's model that's not out yet it might not be road legal it might have been produced yet or it could have been a marketing deal like some kind of brand deal product placement and the the product placement hasn't been it's fully established, hasn't been done yet by the time they're starting to shoot. So they're just keeping that open. It, it's not the case that they can't use a real car, but they're just trying to, they just haven't finalized the planning of, of that yet. In the same uh, same breakdowns as well, you're also seeing that there are some, um, there are some like brand names on buildings as well. And of course you could put that kind of stuff up there, but you have to go up and maybe like destroy the building a little bit <laughs> might need some maintenance at the end and if it's a modern skyscraper you don't want to mess about with that it that kind of stuff makes sense but that's that's the just a very tip of the iceberg a lot of times they're doing stuff like it might just be a car sequence where it, it's a bit more of a dangerous car sequence like a car chase and that stuff makes so much more sense to do in cg yes you have skilled drivers and incredible stunt performers absolutely brilliant people but these incredible people they end up being hurt all the time. I mean, there's a documentary coming out now about Daniel Radcliffe about his stunt double who was almost killed and um, is like, I think he's paralyzed from neck and down. Oh, absolutely tragic story. And that's one of the costs of doing practical effects that it's actually really dangerous. I think on the dark night as well, when the camera crew died, and these are just people who are like seriously injured. You have like a lot of lighter injuries as well. So stunt performers like losing their lives or losing their livelihoods or just being injured like that's a huge concern as well so if you can just replace that with a digital maybe it looks as good maybe it doesn't look as good but you as a viewer in a cinema you're not owed a human life for a slightly better performance (laughs) jesus christ it's (laughs) it's not like there should be a human sacrifice to make top gun maverick they're just entertainment they're just entertainment they're just movies safety has to be a concern i mean alec baldwin killed somebody recently i mean if it's his fault or not he fired a gun that killed as was a cinematographer i think and that's yeah, a so, huge yeah. huge tragedy and you know who knows where the fault lies seems like he's being he was being sued for this or you know there's a lot of criminal trials and all that but it doesn't really matter whose fault it was the point is that person is gone because of at some point in the process, there was neglect. Just do that in comp. Like, do muscle flares in comp. There is no reason whatsoever 
that there should ever be a physical gun on set. So a large part of that is, well, you need wires because then people can jump in a much safer manner if they're doing like actual stunts or digi-doubles can replace can replace things like can replace mm. can just mitigate the danger on set and real movie sets are complicated and dangerous and there is just so much happening here and there and movies have thousands of shots in them it's just an inherently a chaotic environment to be in and one tiny mistake and then alec baldwin's gun contains a real bullet this is what happened to brandon lee as well on the crow as well just got shot with a gun and passed away like that was that was the main actor of the movie who was who was killed in in this case like it's it's a much bigger question than just like is cg good or bad like cg has probably saved a lot of lives in in this case not to like put her on some kind of crazy pedestal but it's just a it's just a useful tool when it comes to mitigating crew safety and i, I really think that is incredibly important because it's just they're just monsters they're just fancy car sequences at the end of the day you'd spend two hours in a cinema you know just enjoy it for what it is yeah and like I, I remember watching like some of the old clips of like uh buster keaton and that that is some crazy shit like the stunts that they did back in the days like jumping actually jumping off of buildings driving in front of trains uh I, there was one i don't know if that was a buster keaton film or, or what it was where they had like a real train drive across real tracks they blew up the tracks and crashed the train into the river uh there, <laughs> you know how i don't I, I mean i don't know how many people got hurt back in back in the day of those stunts that must have been substantial compared to yeah. what we have today luckily you know because we have something that can assist or replace in some case like, like take take the fast and the furious franchise you know obviously getting more and more ridiculous but i think it what helps that franchise is that it is that ridiculous because it's mm. so ridiculous you're like I feel like you just accept it for what it is. Also, you accept the CG craziness. If you have flying cars or whatever you have. I remember there was this one shot in one of them, probably Fast and the Furious 11 or wherever we are, where they're driving around in town with like a giant safe attached to a car. And the safe is like just destroying buildings left and right. Obviously not very practical. But I'm sure it served the purpose to to the story, whatever that was. <laughs> whatever that was, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think a good example here is, we just talked about this, is John Wake 4. And j- just a real quick point to what Hanger was talking about with the, with the gun stuff. There's obviously times where real muscle flashes are important for lighting. Like you have a really dark setting like in john wake where you have it all the time the floor is always wet having a real muscle flash for reflections and everything can make it absolutely like crucial that it's there just for for realism for real lighting um but i I think in a lot of cases you could probably just replace it like you wouldn't need um like the fake fake live ammo or whatever it's called yeah it takes so little to harm somebody yeah exactly there's uh there's a sequence oh like a three-hour film let's call it two-thirds of the film two-thirds of the way through the film where they're driving around in paris around like the arc the triumph and and it's a full cg scene made by rodeo effects where they have real plate of keanu reeves in his car and i think the other cars and they was all shot in a parking lot somewhere you know who knows where and they take that plate and they comp it with the with the CG plate, which is a fully recreated version of that part of Paris. It looks incredible, and it's so well done. Like, you, I didn't think about it when I was watching the film. It wasn't until after I saw the VFX breakdown. I was like, oh, okay, cool. That was CG. And it, did you need to shoot it in Paris? I mean, that's where he is in the story. It makes sense. You want to see popular landmarks. It's always good for the crowds, right? So it, it made sense for the story and the CG was really well done. And then you don't think about it. But on the other hand, you have examples like my favorite, Gods of Egypt, which was the first film I ever worked on, where you have 
actual abominations of CG in that film. And it's just, it's just so horrible. But the CG isn't the only horrible thing in the film. And having the most amazing CG in that film wouldn't have saved the film. The acting was terrible. The writing was terrible. I mean, it was just, it was just an overall terrible, terrible film. And then you have terrible CG. It, it, it doesn't, like, one can't make up for the other. But blaming, like, if you were to blame everything wrong with that film on CG, which is what is happening a lot of the times, it would be unfair, right? It's just another part of a bad film. That's, that's really what it is. Yeah, we talked actually a bit about this on, in, on the um, Blackfire stream yesterday about like examples of good CG. And two of my favorite examples there, uh, I haven't seen The Creator yet, but that looks incredible. And that's, a, that's an ILM show. Yes. And um, it's but a very low budget. And they're able to just squeeze out everything they can out of that budget. And um, the other one is uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Bit of a mouthful. Incredible movie. It looks gorgeous. And it doesn't have a lot of VFX artists on it. And you can do these kind of like very quotation low budget movies here because they're not low budget in any metric apart from maybe just Hollywood, right? If this was a Norwegian movie, it would have been the most high budget movie ever made there. But <laughs> if you have a vision as a director or, or a production designer or, or art director, anything like that, which these people clearly do who direct these movies, then you don't necessarily have, to, it doesn't necessarily have to be crazy expensive because then you can be very smart about it. Like, if we, for instance, in Everything Everywhere All the Ones, then you have a, um, a raccoon. And it's a real live raccoon. Or it's, like, it's a doll, right? It's, and you can very clearly tell that. And it's really funny that it, it's a real raccoon. And there's no reason for that necessarily to be in, done in CG. And it wouldn't necessarily have looked better either. It just would have cost like a million dollars more or maybe more than that. <laughs> and the gag wouldn't necessarily work better. So if you have somebody who knows how to utilize practical effects combined with using the effects, then you get incredible work. And often what's expensive in, in VFX movies is, is all the feedback rounds. Of course, just having like 2,400 shots is expensive. But if you keep iterating on something over and over and over again, this is something we experienced, both experienced when we were in VFX. You, you just end up wasting an insane amount of money. And the reason you're often iterating on a shot or mm. on an asset or something like that is not because it's not good enough necessarily. It just keeps changing. It's because they don't really know what they want to do. We had this on, on a movie I worked on as well where they, they had to basically redo the whole ending for, for the movie because the, the story wasn't proper. Like it wasn't, it wasn't done well enough. And then you had to rush it with CG at the end and somehow the crew was able to like to like patch it through and like just do like do minutes off a whole sequence at the end right before the deadline. And then you might look at this and be like, oh, the CG is a bit dodgy. No, the story is a bit dodgy. <laughs> like what's bad about this is the fact that they hadn't finalized the story or at least not like thought it through until it was supposed to deliver and almost be in cinemas. This happened as well with, I didn't work on this one, but the, uh, the first uh, Wonder Woman movie as well, where they, they just had to mm. redo the whole end sequence uh, right before delivery. And it's not going to work very well. And the CG is going to look rushed as well. And I think one of the things with CG is that bad CG looks really bad, but bad practical effects. Yeah. Like if you have a bad practical monster, the animation is going to look a bit a little wonky and such, but kind of like the rendering, right? Like the integration of it, the shading and such, which obviously you don't have, it's just a real thing. It looks integrated into it. Like an example of this would be like one of the earlier mummy movies where you have like the Scorpion King and it looks terrible. If you were to have the equivalent there in CG or sorry, in practical, it would still look probably quite bad in terms of animation and such, right? It would have to maybe stop motion or some kind of crazy prosthetic setup. But it would still feel like it's integrated into the world. But that's an example where it's not like, yes, the CG is, is bad in that case, but it's not necessarily the fault of the CG artist, most likely not. It's somebody who doesn't know how to use a tool correctly. If you are in the early 2000s, late 90s, and you're just saying that, let's make the whole character just in CG, you're using the wrong tool for the wrong job. A good example of this is Lord of the Rings, where you have Gollum, that it's also from the same era, like 2001 to 2003 with, uh, with uh, Lord of the Rings movies. 
in the first Lord of the Rings movie, Gollum is barely in it. <laughs> and that's a big advantage because you're able to, the Weta team was able to iterate on the character and, and really create something spectacular that's really stood the test of time. But then they're properly spending time on that. They're getting a, a fantastic performance from the actor. They're getting, they're really, really building it up in, in just a way that that just works. Same with David Jones as well. This stuff works because they're spending really proper time on it and they're not just kind of throwing it in there in the end. It's it's a proper... Yeah, it's just something that's just well thought out in, in every single stage of, of the production and then it will stand the test of time. If people are comparing... It's really annoying people are comparing this, comparing Gollum and David Jones to like modern CG and they're sh showing the crappiest shots from some kind of Marvel TV show or something like that in a full CG shot compared to like the best VFX from 20 years ago. The best VFX from today yeah. looks beyond insane. I mean, all of Avatar 2, for instance, some of the most insane VFX I've ever seen. And that's kind of how you got to do it. If you're, if you're building a movie that's all CG, then you got to go the, the, the camera way, the James Cameron way. You just have to go like all in for that. And, and then, then it's going to work, but... It's a really difficult thing to to correctly use CG, I think. And it's particularly if you come from a background as a director where you don't really like natively understand CG, understand VFX. It's very difficult to to like kind of budget that correctly, not just in terms of money, but in terms of like like how, what's the percentage of CG in your film? Yeah, imagine if James Cameron had come out and he had been like no CG in uh, Avatar. I'm telling you, it was just, <laughs> you know, it was just all shot uh, in camera. It's a, it's a, yeah, all practical. I think a an interesting sample I have is I was watching Ahsoka a couple weeks ago, and I, I'm not good with like Star Wars uh, terminology and, and all the races and everything in there, but there's like one of the things, one of the aliens was like it was clearly a guy in a suit and uh, you know star wars has this love for practical stuff and and people in suits they love that they want to preserve that from the originals and that's totally cool you know i support that that's a style choice it's not a this looks better no it's a style choice the problem was this this particular alien race was like super giant head and you could tell that they were wearing mittens because kind of like if you take your fingers right and you draw them back and you're wearing gloves and there's no fingers at the end of the glove. That's what it was like. So when he was walking, the fingers were just like flopping around everywhere. And you're like, that's, that's clearly a guy in a suit. Um, it's like, I don't know what's more practical there to like build it in CG. It takes a long time building the suit. I don't know what goes into building a suit, a mask and everything. It's probably not trivial either. I, I could imagine it's, it's quite a lengthy process. But it's one of those practical moments that stood out to me. Where it was like, I feel like you failed your your job here to integrate it properly, whether it's a budget thing, I don't know, or if it's a, a an aversion to CG, which I can't imagine because all those like all the new like Star Wars series and, and films, I mean, they're so CG heavy. You know, even back in the day when RLM was was first doing it, it was like on the forefront of what could be done, uh, both miniature wise but CG wise as well. So it's I don't know. I, I, I have a personal theory that studios and to an extension of that, whoever advertises the films, they know that people in general seem to have a problem with CG. Where that comes from, I don't know. But they know that that's there. And so they play on, on the practical effects part really heavily because they know that that'll sell more tickets. Like you won't have the opposite you know, a film coming out and say, all, all done in CG, 100% CG, no practical shots whatsoever. Obviously, that wouldn't go over well. Why? I don't know. But that's the current landscape, unfortunately, of, of, of where we are. Could you imagine a movie which was advertised, like properly advertised as using the latest Render Man version? <laughs> This wouldn't work. <laughs> no actors used in this film. It's <laughs> I I have a theory. It's hard to say exactly why this is the case, right? But one of my theories is that people people kind of want to believe that the movies are real, and 
Mm. They obviously know that they're not, but the closer they are to them being real, I think the more they can kind of like relate to them. It's like a thing you're seeing now with like AI, like there's a lot of, uh, obviously it's a huge backlash, rightfully so, against AI. Yeah, and one yeah. of the reasons people are against it is, you know, take away the pure ethical parts, it's, it's the fact that there isn't really a human touch to it. It's why you're seeing a lot of things that there's with clothing as well, it's handmade. Like handmade is, is like a, it's almost like a bus term when it comes to like artists and goods and, and that kind of mm. stuff. And it's yeah, almost yeah, yeah. like, Doing that with a with a movie, it's like you're saying the no, the movie is actually handmade. It's not made in a factory. No, real people worked on this. The kind of the misconception here is, of course, that CG is still handmade. It's just made in a computer. Like you, I think a lot of people <laughs> see CG almost as kind of almost what AI is doing with like Mid Journey and such. You just input some text and you get an image out. Well, it couldn't be further from truth. Obviously, CG is just a craft just that you're doing it digitally if you're creating a set extension or if you're creating a character like we were doing you're just using clay using digital clay and then you're using digital airbrushes and you're using digital latex and digital slime and then you're doing all this kind of stuff it's still a handcrafted product just that it's not done with your hands touching the thing directly you're you're using your hands when you're sculpting i mean how is that not handcrafted right everything is um Everything in, in a CG movie is is in large, large part handcrafted, but I, I think they're not going to try to educate the people on that. Like they're not gonna, the marketing doesn't care. No, it's like, what would, what would they gain from that, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one. I, I think the issue here is it's just in large part marketing. I, I don't think like the actors or the directors necessarily have like a, like a beef with CG. Maybe some do, maybe some don't, but... I think it's just in large part marketing knows this stuff is probably effective, which if it isn't, they need to stop doing this right away. And if it is, then it's <laughs> unethical. <laughs> like I, I have another uh, good example of um, practical and CG. So I was uh, for Guardians of the Galaxy 2. I did the suit for Baby Groot and it was a really fun task. But the way that it was done was some amazing person who wasn't me had designed the suit and had created it physically, right? So we had a physical prop and, and that prop uh, had to be locked away. It had to be, I had to sign for it everywhere I went. Like it was, it was, it was some serious shit. <laughs> um, but it was great because it meant that when I had to create it in Marvelous, I had a perfect representation of what it was. For some reason, they didn't provide me any of the patterns, as far as I remember, so I had to kind of figure that out myself. But it was great for lighting reference and shading reference on set, because for a lot of the shots, we had uh, uh, just a 3D print of Baby Groot in the suit, you know, with chrome balls, with, with uh, color charts and everything, so you could see the lighting on the sets for the suit, which meant that after I had done my job, the shading artist could then come in and much better integrate it into the in, into the plate because they had all this practical uh, footage from from beforehand. I think that's one of the cases where I've seen it be used really well together. And it doesn't matter that that suit in shot was entirely CG; it was still built off of the backbone of the practical stuff. We're just enhancing what we have so we can use it on obviously an animated little tree trunk because. Also, Baby Groot was obviously not real. You know, we couldn't have him running around on set. I think it's uh, that's a perfect way of doing it. That was exactly what we did on Monster Calls as well. And and there isn't beef yeah. between the department. At least I, I I wasn't like, oh, I wish we could have done this from scratch. No, it's just it's just a collaborative thing. And and I just wanted to make the best final frames I, I could. And I, I think that's that's really cool because then you you're just it, it just becomes a truly collaborative thing. If if you have to do something in CG without reference, it just becomes much harder. To do that, for instance, if you're, even if you have a sequence that's going to be built entirely in CG, like you have to recreate the whole thing, but you have reference of, like a, um, like just a, let's say it's a street right here in, in London where I'm currently at, and you just were to have a camera move going through it, and there's just like a gray ball and a chrome ball just being like driven on a motorbike or something, and that's going to be replaced with a Batmobile or whatever it is. It's so much easier to recreate even the whole scene if you have to do that because the whole thing blows up or something than it is to make it from scratch just in CG because 
then you, you know what it's supposed to look like. We, you know, we, we, we just yeah. did a challenge recently now, like just some hours ago, which may or may not be live at this point, where we're trying to like sculpt a camel from, from scratch. And it looks <laughs> awful, right? And that's obviously we don't have reference like that. But if you were to have the real live camel, it's just going to look a lot better than that. Even if you were to try and find reference online of, of like that camel, having a real live camel on set that you can scan and see animation reference off and all that is so much easier. And if it's easier, that means you can do it faster, which means it's cheaper and you can iterate more and that you can have more shots and you can just spend more time on that. So having real life plates that you enhance with CG is, is, is a fantastic way of doing it. And that, that's why they're doing it that way, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, another, another example I have was um, I worked on Kingsman 2, the Golden Circle or, or something like that. I can't remember the title of it. But uh, there's this shot where they go to Italy and, and there's this... A cylindrical gondola that goes from down and up the mountain or something up to a base station and we had to recreate the gondola in 3d there's an action sequence spoilers the cable breaks because it has to and it slams into the ground onto the snow and hey, whoops surprise everyone's fine <laughs> um, the way that they talked about that in in the trailers and behind the scenes stuff you know, uh, leading up to the film was they talked about, because they had recreated it, like a one-to-one -one recreation uh, of the gondola that they could have in the studio so that they could film it. They could like spin around and everything so like the actors could be pressed against the wall while this, all of this was happening. So that was enhancing their performance and the on-plate stuff looked great because now they're obviously in the gondola. But everything outside the windows of the gondola was just a green screen. And so every time you saw something from inside the gondola, it was just mapped onto the plate. If it was even a real plate, it might have been CG. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but, you know, you had active performance and you could control that environment in there. And every time you saw outside the gondola, it was, it was our work. It was a full CG gondola on, on the real plate. And again, I think that was a great sort of marriage between practical and CG where you use the practical for when you needed it and you need it and you use the CG for when you needed it. They, of course, in their marketing, they played more heavily on it being practical so that, you know, they could act in it and everything. The CG stuff wasn't ever mentioned. And I think that's maybe what we're seeing a lot. I wouldn't call, you know, they weren't shitting on CG at all in that stuff. They were just only talking about the real stuff from a, an actor's performance point of view. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with that because oftentimes CG is like this invisible thing, but it is more when it gets unfairly called out for, for like, like if there's no CG in this film, then it's a better film. You know, I think that's where it, it kind of pisses me off. You see this in the, uh, in the Star Wars uh, prequels where they're not fantastic movies, but one of the things you're seeing in those ones is the the actor performances just aren't amazing. Even when you have like actors like Natalie Portman, who's a fantastic actor, the performance just isn't like amazing. And I mean, who who knows exactly why that is? But it sure the hell doesn't help when you're supposed to have an intimate moment with somebody and it's just green around you. Then, but that that's not the VFX faults. Like it's not a, anyone. It's not a VFX supervisor is like messing that up or anything like that. It it's just a planning thing. Then you, if you need a touching moment, you need to realize that actors they need something to to act towards. Right? They need to feel some kind of emotion, and then you need to build it in a way that is not just a green screen. I think that's the terrible way of doing it. That everything is just on a green screen. It's just difficult to do. It's it's like it's difficult work if you have to comp everything in. You have to recreate everything. You have to uh, you have to like integrate things properly. That's just it's just difficult. It's just much better if. If you have some plate to to work from and then you can do what some of the invisible effects that we've been talking about one of them they do all the time is like sky replacements a lot of matte painters who yeah. only make beautiful skies why would you do that well because it just looks better <laughs> like it just it just looks a lot better then you you have movies like um like the, like an oppenheimer it's difficult to say how much of that is cg or or not right like they're they're kind of secretive about it and and having been a dean egg while they were making Nolan shows there. I've seen how little the effects there actually is in, in those movies. Like, I, I know Nolan, he's, yeah. he's very good at, at not using the effects. Uh, one example here is, is in Dunkirk, for instance, where 
it is, is to the point that I actually thought Dunkirk needed a lot more VFX because you're supposed to show this absolute epic ev evacuation that changed the fate of World War II potentially. And it just looks like there are some guys on the beach where that's actually a case where there are just some guys on the beach and then there are like cardboard cutouts, I think, and at the at the ends and such. And that is kind of distracting because the scale is kind of wrong. So in that case, I would have actually argued for more VFX. But in some cases, like with Oppenheimer, let's assume there isn't too much VFX in that. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't, uh, hard to know. But that's a movie that can regardless be shot and be created without VFX. Like you, you don't need necessarily VFX to do it, but you can enhance it with it. Like there's for sure there's going to be like a lot of comp work in, in that movie, like no doubt. A lot of a lot of wire removals and like definitely background replacement or sky replacements and set extensions mm. and that kind of stuff, right? But regardless, you could have made that movie twenty years ago. I don't think you could have made Infinity Wars twenty years ago because that's just it's just too heavy, <laughs> well, it would have right? <laughs> it's just yeah. not a technically doable to actually do that. So a lot of the stuff you're seeing with Marvel, where Marvel fatigue and all the Marvel VFX stuff, is not necessarily that the VFX is bad. It's just that this couldn't have been done in practical. It's just not feasible to build these worlds, and it just opens up a whole new world for what you what you can even do in terms of like movie making. And then you can argue, especially for the Marvel stuff, is should they continue making it? Because a lot of what they're doing now just seems like they need to pump st stuff out in order to keep it going. Uh, personally, I think they should just quit, not because of the VFX, <laughs> but because of the terrible storytelling they have in most of their shows now. But I actually, I'm. I'm about the Oppenheimer stuff, I was um, I was thinking about this a lot because I heard that, like the no VFX thing before I watched it. And one of the first things I, I noticed right early in the film is like they have this shot of almost like it's a representation of string theory or something where they have this, like dark background and these electrical elements and stuff floating around and it looks amazing. I have no doubt in my mind that that isn't CG. It looks, it looks very real because of the, the bokeh and just the way that it has a certain practical feel to it. And I had no problem with that. That doesn't need to be CG. And it's cool that they challenge themselves to how do we get this shot practical. But a big thing for me, where I was massively underwhelmed, but I also think that there might have been a story reason for this, as far as I, I could understand on Nolan, is when they actually make the A-bomb and they do the first test where it explodes, um... The fact that there wasn't an explosion, like you have this two hour build up to the explosion and everything, and you see the practical stuff of it, like things going off a little bit, and you have that classical pyrotechnic line and, and stuff. And I got kind of taken out of the film a little bit because it was so practical, kind of like the example you're talking about with Dunkirk. I, I needed. The, I needed that big explosion. I needed to see that mushroom cloud. Like this is all the stuff that they've been building toward. And I was kind of blue balled at the end of that sequence <laughs> where I was like, oh, is that it? Okay, just some noise and, and, and some light. And I, I, that actually caught me by surprise because I, I didn't expect it. And I think it, it was, the film was worse for it, but it might've been a story reason. I don't know. I, I guess maybe then I just don't agree with that story choice. Uh, but that was an interesting moment for me. I never tried that in a film before. I think this is a perfect example of where CG is actually really strong. I mean, CG is really good at explosions. Like that's that's one of the things it's yeah. legit really good at. Like have a crew of Houdini artists together, and they're gonna make the most incredible yeah. explosions. I mean, a lot of people go into Houdini and effects just because they quote unquote like to blow shit up. Like that's just that's just what they do. They like <laughs> to just destroy things, and. They're very, very, very good at that. Same with um, in Dunkirk as well. One of the things VFX is very good at, and has been very good for a very long time, is, is crowd. Just like adding additional yes. crowds to something where that's, that's kind of a solved issue today where add duty explosion CG and, and add additional crowd. I think genuinely think that the final product is going to look better. Not that I'm giving Christopher Nolan notes here because he's one of my favorite <laughs> directors and it's amazing. Yeah, what he's exactly. I just think it's a little bit silly to be like a maximalist when it comes to these things, when you have tools mm. that are just better at, at that. Like we were kind of yeah, like yeah. joking about this before. Like imagine if the, if the movie was advertised as like having using no cameras. Like, but, but why? <laughs> Cameras are great. <laughs> <laughs> no film was used in the making of these movies. Yeah, was, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I think people oh, I, uh, have uh, something that I I tweeted out uh, not too long ago. We talked about just before this was um, I found some examples from Parasite. Everyone hails that as the greatest film for for you know for many years. Uh, won I think it won an Oscar as well. So mm. you know, pretty universally liked film. CG was used in that film pretty extensively for set extensions, especially set extensions. Uh, you see that with mountains being added in the background of, of shots where the houses, trees, entire streets were CG because maybe they just had that front part of the set, so they extended it. Like This is the kind of invisible CG that happens a lot in films that people don't think about. And I'm wondering if, if the people who hate the idea of CG, they, they draw a line somewhere. If it's all CG for them, or like if they knew everything that goes into CG, sky replacement, digi doubles, set extensions, would they feel the same? Or is it just when it's really grand uh, VFX that where it's like it's obviously VFX, then they have a problem with it? Like you say, maybe it's it detracts from that whole. It feels like it doesn't feel like a real experience because it's not close to reality anymore. Yeah, it's it's generally an interesting one. I mean, it's not like the effects is going away. I mean, in any way, there's more of the effects now no, than ever, no. and uh, it, it's it's being used in a smarter way. I think one of the reasons we we got uh, we were talking about this as well, and we haven't seen it yet, but like Napoleon just came out, I think, and um, mm, the, yep. I think Rid- Ridley Scott he kept talking about how like yeah, practical movie, and there was a lot of stuff around that, and um, a lot of the effects artists who spent a lot of time on Napoleon are like. Are you sure about that, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, so yeah. We we can't yeah, really I'm talk sure too the, much about the that. The end credits are going to be like several hundred people, several hundred VFX artists uh, in the end credits, right? So uh, yeah, Silly. yeah. That that is uh, a bit of a complete side note here, but my god, that is frustrating. The credit system in VFX. So uh, I don't generally don't know what it's like in the other departments, but I have in all in the movies i worked on i think i think i worked on 14 movies in total i checked my mdb recently and i think that was it i've been credited in maybe i don't know a third so like three or four movies or something like that mm. and i don't understand why i mean obviously there's a huge huge wall of text at the end of the credits and there, there are like so many people in it but i don't understand it seems so random when you get a credit i worked on one movie uh called life it was the first one i worked on dneg really nice movie i was texturing there and it's the first time i've seen like texture artists and it's like henning santon and that's really nice if you if you work in other departments like in not in the effects you you will have that you will have like driver or assistant to whatever wh- whoever yeah. is on on set and that's really nice but the effects is just like a huge ball of people a huge group of people and you might not even get a credit I remember that when we worked on uh, on uh, Batman v Superman, I was watching it with um, with a friend of mine who we both worked on on Doomsday. There it was a big team, of course, who created all assets there. But we, the two of us, we we spent a lot of time on it, and at the end, we weren't credited. And we, I think, yeah, you were there as well, Morton. I think we were watching it together, all three of us, and we we're just like, "Are you yeah. serious? We we made <laughs> we, we we created the big villain at the end, and we there was no there was no mention of that." That that sucks. Yeah, it's one of those. It's it's kind of vanity. People, some people are saying that oh, actually matters because if you're applying for a job, you need a credit. I don't think that's true. I don't think no, like no. you can add yourself to IMDb. I don't think if you're applying to Framestore that and you say you've been a DNA for five years, they're not going to go through the movies you worked on and be like, did you actually do that? I don't think <laughs> they don't that's really the case. That. <laughs> no, they don't have time for that, and they're just going to check your references instead. I think it's more a case that come on, guys, come on, you, we can yeah. <laughs> we can do that. Particularly if it's for a, if it's for movies, there might be like a max length of what you can do. Stupid argument, but you know, whatever, it is what it is. But for streaming particularly, there isn't a max length something can be. You can add minutes to to that at the end of it. That's the end of my rant. That is, uh, yeah, this is a very annoying issue. I remember specifically issue. For, for life. I didn't work on life, but a friend of mine, she did. And uh, she was junior at the time at DNEG as well. And she pulled crazy all-nighters for I, like a long time, many days leading up to to the final delivery because it was I've, I've never seen crunch like in VFX before, like I have on on life. And thank God I didn't work on it. She pulled all-nighters. She just you know she really put in the work, and she didn't get a credit. And she was heartbroken. Like she poured her heart and soul in into her work, and no credit. 
And that sucks. Yeah, it's just it's just needlessly cruel. And I'm not even sure if it's if it, it's probably not intended to be cruel. In my, it, it, I think the no, effects no, are I just get so. a certain amount of spots for to show their stuff. But that seems just bureaucratic, and the bureaucracy turns into into cruelty when it comes to that. Like it's it's awesome, right? You've been working on a movie for a long time. You're super excited about it. Your family and friends are watching it, and they're just being like this day this day after the movie, and they're like, "Your name was here," and they they send they take a slightly legal photo in the cinema and they're just like it was there <laughs> and that's like it's the yeah. effects is hard it's a difficult thing to do it's a difficult thing to it's a difficult job to get you have to spend a lot of time just getting good enough to get it and and all that and then you finally pull it off and your name is there and it's just just awesome or it's <laughs> it's just a gut punch <laughs> but it's not there yeah but or even couldn't. you know because it's not like we're we're under no illusions that just because we make a podcast like this and talk about it, we're not going to change the overall public no. perception of what CG is. But I think it's more a, a a way for us to express ourselves as well and talk about the frustration, especially when you have poured your heart and soul into something, and then it it kind of just gets put down because there's CG in it. Um, especially if it's it's a good end product, you know the story's good writing's good the film is is a great film and you've made some really great vfx for it uh it just feels kind of demotivating and and disrespectful to discredit hundreds of people's work just because yeah just because i'm not actually really sure uh i'd actually love to hear from people like people that actually have a problem with it where it stems from and if it's uh if it, if it's a legitimate opinion that they have, or they're just sort of riding the wave of VFX hate because they've never really properly thought about it, or or maybe they don't know what VFX or CGI actually is, they just assume it's the the grand VFX shots and not the not all the invisible CG that that goes into most films these days. Yeah, but I think think that's kind of it. I think we're yeah running out of rants here. <laughs> <laughs> you can only rant for so long yeah it's a it's a it's a it's a topic that's that's been that 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 is pretty dear to my heart like why are they crapping on the work my friends are doing at the moment yeah so uh, we would love to hear your, like, your opinion if you're watching this on youtube feel free to like leave a comment on that or i think you can leave a comment on spotify as well or you know if you're watching us listening to spotify feel free to make sure to subscribe to to it there or wherever you're listening to podcasts if you're listening on youtube make sure to subscribe there as well and we'll be back with the future podcast let us know what you want to hear as well we uh, we're going to be doing this this more the more informal format we're doing now for quite some time it's really exciting to be back to that so we're definitely taking requests yes for uh, for that but that uh, that's about it remember to Sign up for a podcast on all platforms. It is on all the major platforms. So uh, we will see you in the next one. See you guys.